get started right now. I do, I first want to echo what Kelly said. You know, being in a show with Kelly and Catherine is a huge thing for me. Um, you know, Kelly was on my committee 10 years ago. 10 years ago, almost. <laughs> yeah. was the and with, has been a huge influence on me. And Catherine and I have known each other for a long time. They're two people whose work I admire and enjoy a whole lot. And when I find out that I was able to show with them, it just sweetened the deal for me in a big way. And I also want to talk about Tom Neff, who was my professor for the better part of a decade. <laughs> Put up with me. And I'm, I'm being honest when I say this, none of this work would exist without any of these people, especially Tom, because he's the person who started to push me in the direction from being a rather mediocre painter to a fairly decent photographer. <laughs> <laughs> and I have nothing but love for Tom. So, as you can see, my work's normal. You know, and, and no major psychological or emotional issues whatsoever, uh, which artist doesn't, right? So I think people often look at the work and the one thing, I'm sort of like Catherine, I don't have a lot of prepared remarks, but I do always explain to people, one of the things, if I had to describe myself, I say I'm an existentialist, I'm a Jungian, and I'm a surrealist. And in my work, I'm exploring sort of the anima, the animus, a lot of this, a lot of this is dream imagery that comes from my own internal world. And I live with a, a sketchbook by my bed and usually work out of that a whole lot. And I don't force myself into an interpretation of the work very often, but at the end, much like Kelly, I write about my own work and I write short narratives that go with them after that sort of explain the larger story about each image that's going on. And then I pick this very short sort of point of peripety in the middle that explains sort of what's happening. And I just had a book published uh, last year called Almost Fiction, which is, uh, I guess, is that the Museum of Art? Also Museum of Art, I think they have some copies. I didn't bring any. Sorry. I completely forgot. Uh, but a lot of times people, I think, connect with the work a little better when they suddenly read these short stories. And it gives a narrative that I think adds a little bit of texture to it. And it often takes it much farther away from the original interpretation that someone saw of the work. Uh, but for me, it's been a really interesting journey as an artist moving into this completely manufactured realm, going from being a straight photographer, a street photographer, to someone who completely manufactures reality. And for me, it's a really exciting way to work because there's nothing at this point in time that you can't pull out of your, you know, your hat. And I like to leave a good bit of an empathy gap between what I do and the finished piece so that viewers can step into there and sort of participate in it in their own way. And it's not a cop out. <laughs> I think it's a bad thing to always explain the magic trick. And to be quite honest, there are some pieces where people would say, what is this about? I don't know, you dream too, right? Last night I dreamt I was a chicken. <laughs> but Jung says that no matter who we are in a dream, it's always us. If there's your mother in your dream chasing that chicken, you are both your mother and the chicken. And now it's up to you to figure out why you're a chicken in your dream and why you're your mother in the dream. And so I find that's a really interesting way to work. I think the human mind unchained and sort of unfiltered is a fascinating computer. And it does a lot of the work for me before I even get to my computer, which is stuff going on the computer. I'd say any questions. Yes. Do you have recurring dreams? Absolutely. My favorite recurring dream, this is an odd one, but I'm glad you asked, is I live in a house where I discover a room that I didn't know was there. Anybody ever have that one? And you're suddenly excited, because you're like, oh, a ballroom? I forgot I had this. I could move my bed in here. And I've looked for interpretations for it, and there's always some sort of interpretations, but to me it means your mind has discovered a new place inside of itself where there's some space to operate. That's the way I look at it. Because it's never been a bad thing. You know, I always open the room, and you're suddenly like, wow, this was here this whole time? <laughs> and that's how we are as people. You know, I won't, I won't go into the, the tune in, turn on, drop out argument, but I think the human mind does need to be tweaked every once in a while. I think we're designed that way. And those dream states and things like that, I think show us aspects of ourselves that we might not have known were there before. And that's, I love the room dream. I have it maybe once every six months, and I always wake up in a chipper mood. <laughs> Even if the last dream is pretty bad. That, uh, do, you, uh, do you, are you able to control your dreams? I, it's okay. a good question. I have what's called hypnagogia, where I suffer from sleep paralysis sometimes on the way in. And I'll often wake with a start. But if it's an afternoon, it's very strange, and a lot of people have this, but you're half awake, you're half asleep, but you're paralyzed. You know that you're sort of awake. 
And over the years, I started to study what's called lucid dreaming. And once you can relax into the state, you can completely lucidly dream. And it does make it easier. If it's an afternoon nap, it's easier for me, because I can then wake up, go to my sketchbook, and record with pretty good detail some of the things I've seen. And of course, it all gets mixed and matched in the end. Now, if you are interested, I would sound like a proselytizer for this weird religion. <laughs> lucid dreaming is a very interesting way to experience your mind when your cognitive filters are sort of turned off. You know, there's nothing terrifying about it. Other things. <laughs> Great question. Yes. Um, my background is costume design, theater, uh, minor dance. So I'm very intrigued with the sets and costumes in your work. Sure. And um, so if you could explain a little bit about that. And then also, do you work with people that uh, help with costuming or is that just... I wish. <laughs> I, in the past, when I lived here in Baton Rouge, it was actually the Baton Rouge Little Theater mm -hmm. where the most generous people I had ever met. They would let me go in, give them a $10 bill, and take whatever I wanted out of there. Since then, I've been purchasing my costumes. I travel a lot, and when I'm in another country, I usually find items that I need, and if I need a seamstress to alter it a little bit, I will. But all of these are things that I've found and sort of put together. And it, I'm trying to create a, a space that exists in my mind that is not quite Victorian, but not quite modern. I'm, it's always been, I've tried to explain it as this fictional world where we never got past a certain point in time. You know? And to me, it's like this 1920s to 1940s feel. Some of the older work goes back a little further. But one of the reasons that time period fascinated me so much is the world was still, there were still undiscovered parts of the world. There was still undiscovered, you know, people were going into jungles and naming lakes that had already been named, by the way, by the people who lived there. But we gave them <laughs> better names, I guess, you know? And so what I'm trying to do is sort of evoke that time period of humans having a bit of enlightenment, but the world is still a slightly mysterious, slightly alien, and slightly dark place. You know, when you read Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, that's a great example of Humans, it's metaphorical too, of course, but traveling into places they've never been, you know, colonizing, I guess would be a more of a way to put it. But. So it's a great question, and you know, now I'm moving forward in time a little bit, and the newer works, I think, are starting to get a little closer to what I would say is the 1930s, 1940s, and it's because of the new series, Monuments of Want, that I'm working on, is taking place in sort of a communist, um, another piece there, it's taking place in sort of a communist society that I've imagined, you know. And there's some political overtones that we'll get into in here. You know, I know we're all Republicans. Um, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but that's something that, you know, it's, it's getting more and more difficult, though, because costumery is not my thing. But now at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, we have a wonderful new costumer. And she has been so spectacular in letting me come in. And I've given her all of my old ones. And she's letting me take, you know, as many new ones as I need for my work. So it's been really nice. Now, in the movie, there were some incredible headpieces. Sure. Uh, did you build those? Yes, those are all built. Wow. But they're built in a way that you might not think about. They're built completely digitally. So nothing, in fact, in the film, the only real thing in the whole film, including backgrounds, including costumes, are the people. Okay. Um, they were shot in blue screens and green screens, and everything was designed completely virtually. It took three years, just for 14 minutes. Uh, but it was motion tracked and all this stuff after. And it was an interesting journey because I had to learn how to do things all over again. So, and these are the same way, by the way. Uh, there's nothing real in any of these images. The piano's not real, the smoke isn't real, the room isn't real. You know, everything's sort of built from scratch. And the advantage of working that way is it allows me to manufacture reality from scratch. It's a, it's a very fun, godlike ability. You have to be careful with it, though. You know? What did you end up filming since you said you were a painter and not a photographer? Well, there's two reasons. One, I got bored with just still images, you know? Um, I really did. I enjoy it. I still do them. But the challenge, I wanted a new challenge. And I also recently took over the position at University of Louisiana in Lafayette as a new media and digital artist. So I coordinate that area now. And it gave me an opportunity to really start to move more and more into film. I did my first short film actually about eight or 10 years ago. And it was, the bigger problem was technology and training. You know, I've never been trained in any of this stuff, so I had to figure it out. And it took probably about six or eight years for me to get good enough with the technology, the tools, and learning how to design and build my own computer systems from scratch to be able to work this way. Because if you're trying to buy them off the shelf, 
can't afford that. So for me, it was a new challenge, and it was a new way to tell um, stories. You know, I think it, that they become a little more provocative, they become more evocative. Time just adds a new element to it, and allowed me to also start to work with sound design, which was something that was really interesting to me. And so I'm going to continue in that direction. I'm already working on the, the second film right now, storyboarding and working and getting getting the people I need on board for this thing because we're not paying people. They have a hard time showing up. But I have a wonderful sort of cadre of, of actors and models and people who work with me, and we sort of help each other out and do it just for the sheer fun. The sheer horrible three to four year fun. <laughs> <laughs> do you teach a film class in one year? Yes, I teach, uh, I teach video manipulation, I teach sound design, I teach CGI integration, performance and installation. New, different, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I have a Sunday now. I have a Sunday. Sunday, come over to the art department. Yeah, take an interesting class. Uh, could you explain your process a little bit? Yeah, I knew you had I start with sketches. I start with uh, as detailed a sketch as I can get. Because in the end, when the model is in the studio, uh, he or she is in a just completely blank environment and I'm having to give them cues to what they're doing and they're holding just a cardboard tube instead of a ship and there's someone with a leaf blower hitting her and you know 10 different places and talking about the far piece over here and so I have a sketch and I know where the lighting needs to be because once I've got them out of the studio and I start to build this virtual environment and I'm starting to run the physics simulations to the, you know to have the glass exploding I need all this to match together. I want it to look as real as possible. And so once I've done with the sketch and we come back from the studio, I'll then take rough shots of the, the models and then I'll bring it into digital program and start putting the virtual lighting system in and making sure that everything matches. But when we're in there, I'm measuring you know, inclination of the light, how many degrees off the camera is, so that I can create a virtual camera that matches the real camera that I used in the studio perfectly. And then it's just a matter of three or four months of putting things together. And I travel a few months out of the year, usually in Europe or overseas, and I photograph textures. That's all I do. So whenever you see wallpaper or a particular floor, this may be from a floor from Versailles, this may be a floor from you know, the Tate in London or something like that. And all these textures that I photograph get mapped into the spaces. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Sure, why not? So it took you two and a half years to do the film. How long would it take to do like one photograph. one photograph usually takes uh, three to six months, depending on how many. I usually work on one or two at a time, uh, depending on how much simulation work has to be done. For fabric, it takes a little longer because I'm actually simulating the fabric itself as well. Uh, so I have to let the computer chew. I hate to say that, but you set it up and you have to learn the physics. That's the hard part. I have a physics textbook on my desk so that I can look up you know, how particular properties behave. And the program that I use mostly, I use about 10 different programs, but Maya, some of you guys might be familiar with it, is used in high-end film work for CGI special effects and things like that. And about a decade ago, at Tom Neff's behest, I started to play around with it and finding a way to integrate it into photographic art. And was able, over the years, to get well enough sort of with it that you can't tell one from the other. And that took a bit of time. Thanks.